When Hubble made his great discovery, it was for galaxies like our own Milky Way galaxy. And they all followed the same rule, that the fainter they are, the larger their redshift. In other words, the faster they are moving away from us. This is known as the Hubble Law, and directly led to the expanding universe theories. But in the 1960s, there was a new discovery, the quasi-stellar objects, often referred to as quasars. They appear as star-like points on the sky, frequently blue in color, and they have very, very large redshifts, implying that they are at huge distances from the Earth, at the very boundaries of the observable universe. Some astronomers soon found that a vast number of these strange new objects populated the regions around spiral galaxies and were not only observable with radio telescopes, but were optical and X-ray sources as well. There were two properties of the quasars that were difficult for astronomers to understand using the expanding universe theory. The first was that if one plotted their apparent brightness against their redshifts, as one does for galaxies, one gets an unexpected scatter on the diagram instead of the smooth curve made by the same plot done for galaxies. This seems to indicate that the quasars do not follow the Hubble law as do most other objects, and that there is no direct indication that they are actually at their proposed redshift distances. In fact, it is argued that if Hubble had first been given the plots for quasars, he and other astronomers would never have concluded that the universe was expanding. The second property was that quasars are very small, compact objects, sometimes only a light year across. So if quasars are really at their extreme redshift distances, they must then be the brightest and most energetic objects known to astronomers. So energetic, in fact, that untestable, almost metaphysical mechanisms must be applied to explain the phenomena. On the other hand, when placed at their observed distances, that is, in the neighborhood of nearby galaxies, their brightness and energies become normal, and no special mechanisms need to be evoked. This problem has led many astronomers to abandon the idea that all redshifts are due to their speed of recession away from the Earth. And if this is true, then there is no need for an expanding universe, and the Big Bang never happened. The questions arise. Is there a connect the questions arise. Is there a connection between certain types of galaxies and the quasar? Are quasars ejected from galaxies, and in fact proto-galaxies themselves? Is there some other astrophysical process which can explain the redshift discrepancies? One of the world's most controversial experts on the structure and morphology of quasars, Halton C. Arp, has for 35 years proposed just such an idea. For the heresy of opposing orthodox interpretations of the redshift problem, Arp has had to pay a heavy price, the same price paid by many a scientist with new and innovative ideas. Dr. Arp was forced to resign from his permanent position at the Carnegie Institute of Washington Observatories after the Caltech head of the Telescope Allocation Committee threatened him by saying, unless he changed his line of research, they would take away his telescope time. Due to this fact and his ongoing struggle against the established paradigms, Arp is often referred to as the modern Galileo. I remember when I sent the paper into uh the first paper into Astrophysical Journal uh, on, on the nature of companion galaxies, and I had a lot of them on the ends of spiral arms, so it was sure that they were connected, and I showed that they were systematically redshifted. I sent that in with, <laughs> with, with naive, great expectations that people would be terribly interested and impressed on this, and the editor of the Astrophysical Journal at that time was Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who had a fantastic reputation as a, as a master theoretician and also quite an incomprehensible theoretician, and a, and a tremendously powerful uh, figure in the, in the field and editor of the Astrophysical Journal, which is probably the most powerful position in the field. 
and uh, he chose not to, in his wisdom and judicial fairness, chose not to send it to a referee, but he just wrote across the paper, this exceeds my imagination, and he sent it back to the director of my institute, Horace Babcock, with the obvious implication, you've got to do something about this, this uh, staff member of yours who's, who's doing these very bad things. And so Horace called me down in the office one day after this, and I walked in the, his office, into the director's office, and I saw this paper lying on, in front of him with Chandra Sekar's scroll across it. And Horace looked at me and, and said, well, he said, this is just too, too much, and, and, and you're going to have to uh, uh, start looking for another job. And so all I could say to him was, well, if you send me that in writing, please send me in, in writing. And I was waiting in great trepidation for it for weeks and months to get something in writing and I finally never did so I realized that he decided to give me another chance so to speak. Uh, so that was fairly early in the game and then some years went by and there was the, the, the competition for time particularly on the 200 inch telescope was getting more and more heated and, and people were saying well we can't continue to give time to this obviously incorrect and embarrassing research that ARP does. So finally they sent uh, a letter to me from the allocation committee, including a number of the younger members of my, uh, my institute, saying that unless I uh, changed my line of research, that they would have to take away my telescope time.